Next week we're talking about Jabez, and then the fourth week we'll look at Moses. Each one of them give us wonderful examples in prayer. Now, there's lots of people in the Bible that it mentions they pray, but these four that we're looking at in the Old Testament are in a unique category because we literally have their prayer recorded for us in the Bible. It's not, it doesn't just say they prayed, but we actually are looking at what they prayed. And so that's sort of the, um, the thinking in my mind, how I'm, I'm targeting these messages. Um, I did want to mention that tonight we're looking at Solomon and we're looking at Second Chronicles chapter 7. Uh, in two months ago, in the month of June, I did this whole Sunday series called Chronicles of Ezra. And uh, we talked quite extensively about Solomon the first week of that. At this stage, we're going back probably more than two months because that was the very first week of that series that lasted for a month. Um, but we did talk on Second Chronicles chapter 7. Tonight, what we're doing is literally looking at the chapter in front of that. Chapter 6 is Solomon's prayer. And we're going to be looking at the heart of that prayer. There's a, just a slight little bit of overlap in some of the things that I'll say. Um, because Second Chronicles 7, 14 is one of those hallmark verses. It's one that you should commit to memory if you haven't already. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. That's our prayer. And that is one of the most precious promises in all of the Bible. So I would say that's a, just a very important verse that, that we should all commit to memory. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Um, this verse, it means even more to me when I realize that 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is really a response to the prayer that Solomon prayed in chapter 6. In fact, 2 Chronicles 7.14 is a direct answer to prayer. It is God's resounding yes to Solomon's prayer. And so it's important to understand that. So let's, let's look at 2 Chronicles 6. Um, tonight we're going to study the prayer of Solomon at the dedication of, of the temple. Uh, I'm going to just tell you right off the bat, I didn't say this when I did the series a couple of months ago, but, but I'll say it right here. I, I'm not quite sure what to do with Solomon. question always comes up, is he in heaven? I don't know. I, I want to hope so. I really hope so. Um, I'll tell you this, here's all, all we need to know is he's in the hands of a just and loving God. And that's why God's God and not us. And here's what we know. He got off to a fabulous start. And he modeled prayer and humility and wisdom for us. Now, towards the end of his life, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He did exactly what God said don't do, and that was don't marry foreign women because they're going to lead you to worship other, you know, other gods, uh, pagan gods. And, I mean, if Solomon didn't do that very thing, and that's sad. And, uh, you know, he said, he had warned the people of Israel, if you get a king, here's what they're going to do. That king is going to, uh, is, is going to take your young men and they'll be part of the army and your women will be servants and he'll take your horses and confiscate your land. And I mean, you know, pretty much it happened. Just it, not so much in Solomon's time, but boy, after that, the, the wars really, really ramped up. Uh, but simply, I don't know. And, and in fact, it's not important. That's why God is God, and He's in charge of all of that. And if anybody tells you, well, I know 100% um, that so-and-so's in heaven, well, they can't know that. Or if somebody says, so-and-so, I know they're not in heaven. 
I mean, I, I know what you're saying, and we can be pretty sure, yeah. <laughs> but we're not God, are we? So and I'm glad that we serve God who is, is gracious. Um, according to the old story, Queen Mary of England told her court that after she died, they would find the word Calais inscribed on her heart because she said that because she had brooded over the loss of the French seacoast town Calais for so many years. She grieved because she lost Calais. Um, if you could see King David's heart, you would see the word temple. Because he longed so much to have a temple for God. Uh, he, he prayed, God, let me build you a magnificent temple. He prayed, why should I live in this beautiful paneled palace when, when your, uh, your Ark of Covenant is, is living in a tent somewhere? Um, but God told him, you're not the one to do it, David. You have shed blood in war, and, and you're just, you're not the one. Interesting, this really isn't part of the sermon, but um, I'll just share something that I was reading recently by one of George Wood's books called Road Trip. George Wood, if you don't know, he's our, our general superintendent. He would be our national pastor in this and his God. He was talking about when, when David died, and he gave instructions to his son Solomon, and he, and I'm very much, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, now this one guy, he's, you know, a dirty, rotten scoundrel, just take care of him, take him out, son. Don't let him, don't give him an itch. And then he said about another guy, um, remember to be kind to his, his sons because of how kind he was to me. And then he said about another guy, um, son, God will give you wisdom, and you'll know how to handle it. Three different cases. Um, it really gives a great model for leadership because there's some things that you just need to do away with, and then there's some things that you just need to honor and keep, keep them lifted up and keep them moving in a good direction. And then there's some things you sort of just table it, and you sit on it, and you pray for wisdom. And, but David did that, it's appropriate, because we're right here at that spot where David turns over the kingdom to Solomon. Now, David had stored up material, he made all kinds of preparation, he, uh, of course, he planned for the stones and the, the masons and everything lined out, all, uh, plenty of gold, plenty of silver, he wanted to build a temple and God said, no, you're not the man. And so, he relinquished that over to, to his son. And he said, son, you'll build it in, in God's timing. So let's read uh, 2 Chronicles 6. Uh, now they have they built the temple. They've actually, this is the dedication of the temple. They, they finished it. And this is not so much the prayer. It is sort of prayerful, but it's more of an introduction to the prayer. Verse 1, then Solomon said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in a dark cloud. I have built a magnificent temple, a place for you to dwell forever. While the whole assembly of Israel was standing there, the king turned around and blessed them. And then he said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hands has fulfilled what his prom he promised with his mouth to my father David. For he said, Since the day I brought my people out of Egypt, I have not chosen a city in any tribe of Israel to have a temple built for my name to be there. Nor have I chosen anyone to be the leader over my people Israel. But now I have chosen Jerusalem for my name's sake to be there. And I have chosen David to rule my people Israel. My father David had it in his heart to build a temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, because it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well to have this in your heart. Nevertheless... You are not the one to build the temple, but your son, who is your own flesh and blood, he is the one who will build the temple for my name. The Lord has kept the promise he made. I have succeeded David, my father, and now I sit on the throne of Israel, just as the Lord promised. And I have built the temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I have placed the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with the people of Israel. Now, Beginning at verse 12, it gives us a picture of how grand this event was, how, 
how spectacular. This was just an amazing dedication. It, because it says here that Solomon stood on uh, an altar in front of the whole assembly, assembly, spreads out his hands, and it says that he had a special platform made just for this occasion. So just try to imagine a sea of people as far as the eye can see. And here's the king standing up, and it says uh, he, he stood on the platform, and he spreads his hands out, and then it says, and he knelt before the whole assembly. Spreading the arms out in prayer was typical custom for, uh, for Eastern culture. I mean, that was just the way it was done. You would stand and extend your hands, both of them out, and, and pray upward. And, and it almost gave a, physical, a visible picture of receiving, not so much proclaiming, but the hands turned this way as if to receive as you pray. And that was customary among uh, Eastern culture. And even to this day, uh, it still is. But then for him to kneel, it didn't, that was not typical. In fact, this is the first time in the Bible where it mentions someone kneeling in prayer. I find that interesting. I, I thought, wow, you know, that's, that's pretty interesting. When I read that, I, I tried to think, well, is that right? And at least I wasn't able to come up with anybody who had had knelt in prayer that it mentions in the scripture before this. So here you have, you've got the dedication of the temple. He's extending his hands in prayer. He's up on this high platform, but now he just falls to his knees. A beautiful picture of humility. And so, um, of course, the prayer begins really at, at verse number 14, and, and this is the prayer. So all of what we've read is more of an introduction but, but it's important to keep that picture in your mind's eye that he's kneeling on a platform and just a picture of humility in front of the people. Verse 14, he said, O oh Lord, God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven or on earth. You who keep covenant of love, the covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised, with your hand you have fulfilled it as it is today. Now, Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, the promises you made to him. When you said, you shall never fail to have a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your sons are careful in all they do to walk before me according to my law, as you have done. And now, verse 17, and now, O Lord God of Israel, let your word that you promised your son, your servant David, come true. Then I'm not going to read all of it, but as you look at verse 18, uh, the prayer, you know, will God really dwell on earth? God is big as the heavens. Is he going to dwell in this, this temple that we've made? But, verse 19, but even in spite of that, give attention to this temple. Remember this temple, Lord. And then verse 20 is, is important. May your eyes be open toward this temple day and night. This place of which you said you would put your name there. And then um, the prayer continues. Uh, and you see down at the end of verse number 21. Hear from heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. So there's... So far, we've, we've got three important prayer requests that Solomon prays at the dedication of the temple. One, protect the line of David. Protect the bloodline of David, your servant. Lord, you said that you would always allow someone of, a, of one of the sons of David to serve on the throne. So do that. It's a prayer to continue what, what had been promised. Number two, let your name be attached to this temple. I think there's beautiful wisdom when Solomon prays. He says, and again, I'll just paraphrase. Lord, it's really sort of ridiculous for us to think that, that you could dwell in a temple like this. I mean, for us, this is really spectacular. We sunk a lot of gold into all of the furniture and all of this temple. It's magnificent. It's beautiful. 
But I mean, really, does it impress you? Because you made all the gold. You made all the hills that the gold was dug out of. In fact, if we stare into the nighttime sky, we see stars as far as we can see, and we know it's only just a blip of your creation and your universe. You made all of it. I mean, are we really expecting you, the one that made the entire universe, to confine yourself to this little temple? And yet, and yet, let your name be attached to this temple. That's powerful. I mean, just think about, well, it's, it's similar to what was asked of Jesus Christ. Would you be willing to leave the portals of heaven and the splendor and the glory of heaven and come to experience life from man's point of view? Well, when we talk about the emptied excellence that he gave us in Philippians chapter 2, he left everything and he emptied himself and came and experienced life as a man. Faced everything that we faced and yet was without sin. Was tempted at all points, Hebrews says, but did not sin. So it, it's sort of similar. Jesus gave up everything to come to this earth. And, and God the Father allowed the majesty of His name to be attached to that temple. What was it, 90 feet long, 45 feet across? I'm not sure about the dimensions. It, it was not a huge, huge, you know, and just a, a beautiful building. Nothing like it to that point. But it's amazing, and God, that was the prayer. God, let your name be attached to this temple. And then the third prayer is to allow forgiveness to flow. God, protect the line of David. Not, not as a selfish thing. Da Solomon, understand, Solomon's not saying, I'm in the bloodline of David, make me successful. He's saying, you have prophesied through the servant Nathan that David's line would always have a king on the throne. Don't let us mess it up. I mean, it's, it's in humility. God, let that happen. And then the second thing, let your name be attached to the temple. The third thing, forgive. Hear from heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. Now, I won't go through every single verse, but, but basically this prayer that Solomon prays is very structured. There's seven different requests that he has. And every one of these seven requests is connected to God's answer in the next chapter, chapter 7, verse 14. So the first one I'm calling this, um, when a man has wronged his neighbor. So 2 Chronicles chapter 6, seven different prayers. The first is about the neighbor. When a man has wronged his neighbor. So verse 22. When a man wrongs his neighbor and is required to take an oath, and he comes and swears the oath before your altar at, in this temple, then hear from heaven and act. Judge between your servants. Repay the guilty by bringing down his own head on what he's done. Declare the innocent not guilty and establish his innocence. I mean, does that have any application for our day? at all. Um, do the neighbors ever not get along in our time? Um, I mean, everything from water rights to just plain and simple harassment, that, that pertains to us today. And, and we can pray these things to our God. We can be assured that He hears us. Um, so, that's Solomon's first request, and that's verse 22. And, uh, there, like I said, there's There's seven of them. The second one has specifically to do with war. And in fact, when we are defeated in war. Verse 24. When your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back and confess your name, praying, making supplication before you in this temple, then hear from heaven, forgive the sin of your people Israel, and bring them back to the land you gave to their fathers. 
Um, Solomon assumes that there's a direct correlation between a godly king and a blessed nation. It's an assumption on his part. Leadership is crucial. Um, the nation that serves God will be blessed. And then notice uh, verse number 26. Specifically is talking about when there's been times of drought. And I mean, we've just think of recent years in America's history. We've, we've experienced severe drought throughout the Midwest. I know, I remember reading about in Texas, my home state, when they were uh, out in West Texas, they were uh, burning uh, cactus petals and to be able to, you know, chop it down and have something, anything to give to horses. It, it's been, there's been severe drought. But verse 26 says, when the heavens are shut up and there's no rain, because your people have sinned against you, and they pray toward this place, this temple, and confess your name, and turn from their sin. That's important words there. They confess their sin, they turn from their sin, they confess your name. Then verse 27 says, then hear from heaven, forgive their sin, the sin of your servants, your people, Israel, teach them the right way to live and send rain. It's appropriate when there's times of drought to pray. And many people laughed at the governor of Texas who called for a prayer rally. We've got drought. Can we all come together and pray and ask God to forgive our sins? But that is a biblical mandate. When there's a drought, get serious with God and say, God, forgive our sins. And heal our land. Smart man. Uh, number four, times of calamity. Seven different prayers that he that he prayed. Uh, this is verse twenty-eight. When famine or plague comes to the land, or blight or mildew, locusts, grasshoppers, enemies besiege them in their cities. Whatever disaster or disease may come. And when a prayer or plea is made for any of your people Israel, each one aware of his afflictions and pains, spreading out his hands toward this temple, verse 30, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Forgive and deal with each man according to all he does, since you know his heart. For you, you alone know the hearts of men. There it is. I mean, you, God only knows the hearts of men. But verse 31, so that they will fear you and walk in your ways all the time they live in the land you gave our fathers. Um, funny, he had no problem saying that punishment comes from God. Um, now, I think we have to be so very careful because what happens sometimes is people will say, well, uh, this natural disaster happened and that means God's mad at America or whatever. I've, I've never felt that that's good. But I, I think when you look over the broad sweep of things that happen in a nation's history, you have to become aware when there is when there are disasters and when there's real calamity, then... Maybe, at least, the, at the very least, we should say, God, you have our attention. And we pray to you and we seek your face. Um, the fifth one has to do with foreigners, treatment of foreigners. And this is really interesting. I mean, um, is that in the news at all in our nation? Do we have any issues? that need to be resolved re re regarding foreigners. And um, so when foreigners join the Jews, look at verse 32. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your great name, your mighty hand, and your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays toward this, this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. And do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people Israel. Um, 
I, I think that it's very important that people who become citizens of the United States that they do it the right way, the proper way. I think there should be a great deal of respect because there's been many people who were immigrants who worked very hard to to uh, be citizens of the United States. So I'm, I'm not in favor of uh, amnesty or anything like that. But I want to tell you something. There was a there was a place in the Jewish people for foreigners to be welcomed and not to be beaten down. Now, any nation must have a system and it has to be adhered to. But I, there's, I, I'm always, I'm wanting to be compassionate and I, because I recognize that God has been compassionate to me. So, and then the sixth area, and, and this is different from the second one. This is really about aggressive war, not not necessarily being defeated in war, because that's what number two was about. But this is this is aggressive war. And look at verse number 34. When your people go to war against their enemies, wherever you send them, and when they pray to you toward the city you have chosen, and the temple I have built for your name, then the same exact words again, verse 35, then hear from heaven their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. Um, a, a nation should never presume success in any war, war should always be entered into so cautiously and carefully and prayerfully. And then the last one uh, has to do with captivity. And I guess I should put, um, let's see, I didn't put up there the different Verses uh, 32, 34, 36. For those of you who are keeping score at home, so to speak. Um, verse 36 says this, When they sin against you, for there's no one who does not sin. That's a, a very important verse. And you become angry with them and give them over to their enemy who takes them captive to a land far away or near, and if they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive, and repent and plead with you in the land of their captivity, and say, we've sinned, we've done wrong, we've acted wickedly. And you can read on verse 38, there's more of repentance turning back, and then, but when you get to the end of verse 38, when they pray toward this temple that we've built in your name, in verse 39, the same exact words again, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Hear their prayer and their pleas. And uphold their cause. And forgive your people who have sinned against you. So uh, all of this is, is just a, a real picture of completeness. Because uh, you notice he prays seven different times in seven different ways. Seven uh, always in the Bible is a picture of completeness. Seven days of creation. Seven different world powers um, in truly in the history of mankind. Um, in fact, if, if you study from the beginning of Adam and Eve through to current time, uh, just very close to 7,000 years of, of human history. And what this is saying is really, it's Solomon's way of saying completely and in every way, which is the total package, we surrender to you. No matter what we face or no matter what we do, if we find ourselves in any trouble at all, we're going to discipline ourselves. This is Old Testament now. This is before Jesus has come. But we're going to discipline ourselves as Jewish people. We're going to look towards Jerusalem. We're going to pray to this temple because it bears your name. We will humble ourselves. We will seek your face. And when we do that, God, we expect you to hear us and forgive us and heal our land. Um, the, the amazing statement, of course, that we can take out of Solomon's prayer, uh, if you bring it into a New Testament context, 
Paul made a statement to the church in Corinth. Chapter 6, verse 19. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So in the New Testament paradigm, each person who has a relationship with Jesus Christ, each individual who has asked Jesus to live in their hearts, we are the temple of God's Holy Spirit. No more going to a physical temple and offering a bull sacrifice or a ram or a goat or two turtle doves or whatever you have to do or grain offering. No more of that. Jesus, once and for all, laid down his life as a perfect sacrifice for our sins so that we can be forgiven. And if we believe in Jesus, and if we embrace faith in Him, then by faith, He lives in our hearts. And so, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean for you? Well, does it mean, does it mean that you never have to pray this way? No, not at all. It just means you don't have to make a trip to Israel to pray. Aren't you glad? I mean, you, you don't have to observe the 613 commandments of Old Testament uh, Judeo law. If, if you mess up on any one of them, then, you, then you've got to offer a sacrifice to make good on it. Uh, there's some silly ones too. I mean, one of them says that you, will not, you are not allowed to eat cereal outside of Jerusalem. And so I've done that all my life. <laughs> so I, 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 there's not enough way. I couldn't afford the trips over to Jerusalem to go to the temple for my life. Every time I messed up, I mean, could you? Could anybody live that way? You, you know, I, I think it's honorable to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but, but you don't have to face the temple, I guess, east is that way. You don't have to face the temple when you pray. What you have to do is understand that now you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And any time God's Spirit convicts you, you can pray just like Solomon did. You can get down on your knees just like Solomon did and say, God, forgive me. I was wrong. Here's my sin. I just confess it to you. It's not pretty. There it is. I just put it right out before you. Please hear me from heaven. Forgive my sin. Heal my land. And God will do that for you. So, just to close this out. Uh, the end of Solomon's prayer is, Now, my God, verse 40. May your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Now arise, O Lord God, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your saints rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not reject your anointed one. Remember the great love promised to David, your servant. What a beautiful prayer. As, as we head into the fall, I, I have said several times lately that discipleship is so much on my heart for this year, and especially as we go into 2014. I, I want us to be good at making disciples. I think we're good at making converts. And, Praise God, there has to be a point of salvation. But God's Word says, make disciples of all nations. One of the most important parts of being a disciple, one of the most important parts of being a Christ follower, let me say it that way, is prayer. And I'm... I'm amazed by talking with folks and finding out that there's a, a good number of times when I, I hear comments from individuals that make me realize that prayer is like a, a special thing that happens from time to time rather than a disciplined, important appointment that takes place every single day. And I want to tell you, you guys, it has to be the most important appointment of our day, every day, to spend time with the Lord, to read His Word, and to pray. Now, I wouldn't be legalistic and say, you have to do it for X amount of minutes, and you, or it doesn't count, or you must you know, read this much, or that's not good enough. God will lead you. 
But I tell you, it's critical. How can we know Him if we don't have fellowship with Him? How can we be His representatives if we're not truly spending time with Him? So tonight, just as, as I'm closing with a word of prayer, really what I'd like you to do is just do a self-evaluation. Um, I almost, I almost feel like Jesus, you know, with Nicodemus. You hear the wind blowing. <laughs> Boy, we can hear the wind blowing tonight. Um, in fact, Joanne told me the wind blew her here tonight. She said, yeah, the wind blew me this way. <laughs> Maybe that's a real picture to us that the wind of the Spirit is blowing too. And I just, I pray that as you just do a self-evaluation, God will put a, a, a new commitment to prayer upon your heart. Just a, a new yearning, a new call to be with Him. So let's bow our heads and ask Him for that. Heavenly Father, we really do want to be people of prayer. In fact, I don't know any Christians that would say, I disagree with the idea of prayer. I don't think prayer is a good thing. I don't know anybody that would say that. And I, I really believe that we mean that. We mean that with all of our hearts. But we have pressing matters, all of us, every day, between work and, and family and commitments and obligations. And the day can get so busy so very fast. The plate can get so full with just stuff. And it's, it's all important. But the most important appointment of every single day is to be with you. Help us to pray often throughout the day. Help us to have unbroken fellowship with you throughout the day. And, and at the very least, let us, each one of us, make an appointment each day to spend time with you. At the very least, maybe we can't have long conversations with you every day, but that would be wonderful. But help us to have meaningful conversation with you at least one time throughout the day to have an appointment with you. And nothing, nothing gets in the way of that appointment. Nothing. Don't let anything become more important than that appointment. Even we may find ourselves saying, I would love to do that with you, but I've got this pressing appointment that I must keep. Nothing is more important than you. Teach us, we pray. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so here's what I'd like us to do. Some